Sound All right, good. everyone. Welcome back to the Have It All podcast. Oh, man. Buckle up your seats. We're going for a ride today. Uh, I, <laughs> in the world of how things happen and how things manifest, um, of all people, we're going to be talking to Rabbi Manus Friedman today about the joy of intimacy. First of all, just thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Oh, you're so welcome. I love this. It is, uh, it's, <laughs> for those of you guys that don't know me, my, uh, or don't know this, my brother-in-law is also a rabbi and I've probably shared on this podcast, uh, different points of view of religion. And, uh, we spoke with, uh, Rabbi Friedman here. Our last names are eerily similar. Um, we spoke about how interesting it is that, uh, we're going to be talking about love and relationships from a rabbi. So get your head around that. That's, that's step one. And uh, two, he wrote an awesome book called The, the Intimacy of Joy. Um, and so I read it. I actually have some excerpts that I want to read to you guys to set the stage and then um, just dive right in and ask uh, the rabbi some questions. So before I do that, uh, rabbi, is there anything that you want to say to just introduce yourself and say hello to the listeners? Hello, listeners. <laughs> Shorten to the point. What a, day, what a day to start. What a way to start the day. Always, always, always. These are some of my favorite ways to start the day. So I want to read something that um, I think gives a really good context to what this is. And, and what I loved about the book more than anything else is that it really throws a lot of strongly held beliefs, culturally held beliefs into question. Um, and at least I hope from this podcast, you guys leave with a bunch of places to inquire, not that you're doing something bad or wrong, just a new perspective to look from. So uh, one of the things that I thought really set this up was you wrote, indeed, the exclusive invitation to enter the space of the other is never given. It is not issued once and for all time. Likewise, a couple should never take for granted that they have achieved a permanent state of oneness or that intimacy is something that automatically and always possesses. Intimacy cannot be clutched and saved like a possession. In each physical encounter, intimacy must be achieved all over again. And I, we were talking about this even before, about how relationships, people kind of assume that it's a one and done thing. Like I said, I do. I said, I love you. And it's, and it's all there. Um, so I just wanted to kind of create that as the construct for all this. And then really start with this question about love. Um, you said something really, really fascinating that, that kind of early on just jumps out off the page, which is that love isn't a proper barometer for relationships. And you wanna hear the, the synchronicity and beauty of the world? A friend of mine literally, not even an hour ago, messaged me about him having this exact conversation because his wife said almost word for word what I'm about to read that was written in your book. So this is like the most perfect uh, time. If wanting love by itself is the theme of a marriage, the whole marriage is endangered. You now have a big condition to the marriage. Love me or else. Watch your step because I can replace you. That's not a marriage. That's a negotiation or a terrible threat. If a husband feels that way about his wife or vice versa, she was never a her. She was only a thing. So I'd love for you just to chime in and talk about why love is not the barometer of relationships or something that, that people should be striving for. Well, one of the way, by the way, I know that woman. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know millions of that woman. <laughs> one of the ways of looking at it is we all talk about unconditional love everybody wants unconditional love but you see that, that's an impossibility it's a contradiction in terms unconditional love means my emotion my emotional response to you is fixed unchanging then it's not an emotion anymore it's a fixation the excitement of emotions is that they're fickle and fragile and they come and they go and they rise and they, and they wane and that. So 
An emotion means my response to you. If I have a fixed response, I decided I'm going to love you no matter what you do. I'm not responding to you anymore because hmm. you don't count anymore. So really, I mean, if you'll notice this, you say to your child, I love you unconditionally, and the child doesn't like it. In fact, they might even act out just to get you to stop it. Hmm. Don't love me unconditionally. Love me when I'm lovable. Hate me when I'm hateful. Hmm. Then I know you're responding to me. Hmm. That's the excitement of emotions, and love is an emotion. On the other hand, a relationship has to provide stability and security at the very least. If we establish a, a true relationship, it means I have arrived. I am where I'm home. I am where I belong with the person I belong with. That has to be unconditional. So we've turned it around. Hmm. We said the love is going to be unconditional. The marriage, eh. <laughs> <laughs> No wonder we're alone in the world. So you got to turn it around. The relationship is unconditional. So a mother should say to a child, I am your mother unconditionally. I will always be your mother without any conditions. In fact, I will be your mother even when I hate you. Mm. And right now I hate you. <laughs> it's so funny. You're, you're, you're saying this and I had this moment. I had a a reading done by this woman and the whole reading was around uh, our, our kids. So she did one, we were supposed to have a follow-up and right before the follow-up, I'm, you know, I'm trying to put the kids down to bed. My wife was going to join me. It was an 8 PM start. So I'm rushing. And I literally like, I, I'm, you know, it's amazing when kids know that you have a timeline, it's, it's when they do all of the things not to help you get to that timeline. And so I literally at 7:50, I need to go set up for the call. And I leave and I am irate, like everything inside of me is boiling. And the irony is I'm about to go sit with this woman who's about to talk to me about, you know, my souls and children's souls and this and that. And I'm just sitting there boiling and I'm like, oh, so yeah, I know the feeling very, very well. I have a question that um, at, you said something and I just want, I'm, I'm curious your, your take on it. So. Um, I will love you when you're lovable. I will hate you when you're hateful. So if we looked at this from God's perspective, for example, you know, does God have in your perspective, this approach as well? Because I, I you know, we were always been told God loves you unconditionally. So does God also is God, I'm in a relationship with you unconditionally the same way? Yes. There's wow. the beautiful, the beautiful teaching in the Midrash where when the Egyptians were drowning in the, in the sea after pursuing the, uh, the Israelites, uh, the angels came to sing their songs. Their, that's what angels do. And God said, how can you sing when my creations are dying? Mm. Now, he's punishing them because they were so bad. But at the same time, they're my creations. What, what are you singing about? Mm. This, is, this is sad, right? Or I, I'm, I despise you. You, you make me, you make me uh, angry. You, you, but you're my children, so what am I going to do? <laughs> <clears throat> so is it, is it a I put up with you? You know, what, so whether it's children or, or intimate relationship, things like that, um, obviously we are emotional beings. There's no way to turn that off. That that's, it's our God given ability, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Cause obviously every single person has had an experience where they feel like they want to kill the other person. I mean, it's just like, I, I either want to run away. I want to hide. I want to kill you. I don't know, but I don't want to be around you right now. Hence so the, hence the commandment thou shalt not kill. <laughs> We've been given rules. Yeah. So um, let, let's talk about that for a bit. You know, what, what's that experience like and how can we uh, bring a level of, I don't know if it's love or intimacy in that case to that situation. 
Well, the first thing is we have to separate importance from pleasure. Mm. I can get great pleasure from something. It doesn't make that thing important. Right. Let's not confuse, you know, them. So look at how nasty it is when we think that when I love somebody, that person is the most important person in the world. When I love you, you are the most when I stop loving you, you're garbage. Mm -hmm. My emotion imparts importance. My pleasure, my feelings, my opinion makes you important. That is dangerous. I change my opinion, you're nothing. No, I can't be. There are people who are important in your life. You ought to love them. Mm -hmm. If you don't love them, they're still important. There are people who are not important in your life, but you love them. They're still not important. It's like chocolate. Chocolate is very important to me, by the way. I, I, I hate, yeah, I hate to start up with that example, but people get very, <laughs> they're very defensive about it. But yeah, yeah, I get rid of my brother-in-law, but not chocolate. <laughs> You just leave me my Nutella. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so how do you convince the average American child that the brother he hates is much more important than the dog he loves? Because mm. he doesn't think so. His dog comes first. Why? I love my dog. So love is being seriously abused, misused, Love is the feeling you ought to have towards someone that is important in your life. It's the sizzle to the steak. Okay. The icing on the cake. Hmm. But it's not the steak and it's not the cake. It is not a beast of burden. It is not what carries a relationship. It's what, it's what enhances a relationship. And if the relationship is important, well, spice it up. Well, that's a really beautiful segue. So if love is the icing on the cake, what is the cake? What is the, the piece that we've missed or have confused to build the foundation of a, a successful relationship on? Is there really a cake under all that whipped cream? Oh, yeah. There's got to be. <laughs> Intimacy is the art, and it's a divine art, of merging yourself with another self beyond all things. That's really unconditional, beyond all things. If a man says, I love everything about my wife, it sounds like an ideal marriage, but it's not. A man says, I love everything about my wife. And I said, so why does she want a divorce? <laughs> <Something's>, <laughs> something that doesn't add up here. Yeah. Do you love her? He said, I love everything about her. I said, that was not the question. Mm -hmm. Do you love her? He said, what about her? I said, nothing about her. Do you love her? He says, what does that mean? If you love everything, look, a man says to a woman, very honestly, please marry me. I love your money. I love your looks. I love your family. I love your sense of humor. I love your values. I love everything about you. Mm. He's not marrying her. He's marrying the money, the looks, the what? So he's marrying all those things, which is basically polygamy. <laughs> he's, mar he's married to too many things yeah. and she's not one of them mm. intimacy means get past all those things i don't love you for your money i love you and i don't love you for love i love you to have you not to have more love 
we, we really do worship love in America. It is the idol of our society. Big time. Big time. And like every idol, it disappoints. It yeah. doesn't do what it promises. Yeah. It's, so, it's fascinating as you're talking about this, what's occurring to me is that, you know, we could be talking about this as a intimate relationship, right? And a lot of people will probably hear this husband and wife, et cetera. But when you talk about we idolize love, you know, there's so much importance about loving what you do, uh, loving your children, loving your body. You know, you can take, and, and I'm just putting this in there. So as you guys are listening to this, there's all these different layers that you can take the same concepts as well. Yeah. Right. So you should love your children. Why? Well, because love makes the world go round. No, my children make the world go round. And that's why I should love them. Mm -hmm. So the importance is on who you're loving, not the love. And the same thing is true, as you mentioned, the same thing is true religiously. You believe in God. You really believe in God deeply, truly. Your faith is amazing. Is God real? Mm. <laughs> your faith is real. But is he real? Mm. What you believe must be more real than your belief in it. Say that no? one more time. The thing you believe in must be more real than your belief in it. Mm. Now, many people, you ask them, is there a God? They say, well, I believe it. I say, yeah, but is there? If you stop believing, would he disappear? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Without your faith, is he still God? <laughs> Brilliant. And the same thing. If you don't love your wife's looks anymore, she's not your wife anymore? You're not mm. married anymore? Come on. Mm. So love is, again, the spice. It is not the... now. Today, particularly, there's this, you know, the whole thing going on in the news with Me Too yep. and men abusing women. And so some people say the problem is the abuse of power. People in power take advantage. And that's always been a problem from the beginning of history. Power corrupts and people with power think they have rights. Okay, we know that, and we should do something about that. Nobody ever came out and said, give people in power more power. Let them abuse people. Nobody says that. It's not a philosophy in life. Then there are people who say, no, the problem today is that men don't respect women. That's also been a problem for a very long time, and we should do something about that. But nobody ever got up and said, let's make a philosophy out of not respecting women. Come on, that's ridiculous. So what brought us to this condition? Many of the men who are abused, uh, or are accused of this abuse, if you speak to them, you'll discover that they're really decent guys. They're nice average people. They're not monsters. And you say to them, don't you have any respect for women? And they'll say, of course I have respect for women. So you ask, well, then why did you do what you did? And their answer is going to be almost without exception. What I did, it was nothing. It was nothing. You know, I touched her. I looked at her. I said to her, it's nothing. So you see what has happened? We have lost respect for intimacy. Mm. And this is true of men and women. And we didn't lose it by accident. We worked at it since the 60s. We have been reducing intimacy to playfulness, to recreational sex, free sex. Now people say, oh, how could you do that? What? We were having fun. Mm -hmm. So touching you doesn't mean anything. Nudity doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, a suggestion doesn't mean anything. What are you getting so upside? We've been working for 80 years 
at relaxing. Have a little fun. What's the big deal? Turns out it's a very big deal. We are so uncomfortable with our own intimacy. We're so confused because it's a lie. It is a big deal. Even being alone in a room with the door closed, a man and a woman, it's a big deal. Not because something else might happen, but because being alone together is very cozy. It's intimate. You can't fool Mother Nature. So a guy says, yeah, I was alone with her in the room. That's not, it, she's not my type. Intimacy is not created by your intentions. So if you're in a room with a woman alone and, and you don't feel anything intimate, well, you're dull. <laughs> 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 You're jaded. Something wrong with you. Mm. There's, there was something that you said in the book. I'm going to see if I actually saved it. It was, it was this whole concept uh, that we're kind of talking about and, and just uh, I want to hone in on where – oh, here it is. You said love is personal. It's about me. Intimacy is about us. And I think the way you said it is once again – True intimacy respects that all of you belongs to you. And if you invite me in, it's a privilege. It's not, I love you, let's be intimate so I can have all of you. Instead, it's, you have allowed me to be intimate with you. And now that we are intimate, I love you. And within this paradigm, love is the result of intimacy, not the cause of it. So that's kind of what you, you're talking about now, yeah? That's, that's why... I call it, love is a thing. <clears throat> you can have it. You can not have it. You can have more. You can have less. It's a thing. I don't know what that beeping is. <clears throat> it's all good. Good. Um, sex is also a thing. So look, look, this is really ironic. The thing that is destroying marriages today is love and sex. That should have been the title of the book. <laughs> love, love and sex should be taken out of marriage. <laughs> and then that the marriage... Much people to pick up the book. <laughs> and, and then the marriages will be perfect. Yeah. So, <clears throat> it's, really, it's a really interesting spin. Because, I mean, it's such a common thing. A couple are intimate. And afterwards... He will ask her or she will ask him, how was it? How was it? You calling me an it? Yeah. <laughs> was there an it in the room? I didn't notice. <laughs> and, and who let the it in? <laughs> I thought this was about us. There was just us. What's the it? And also, <laughs> you have to ask, where were you? You weren't there? The ego was there. But you were not there. You were completely caught up in your own experience. And you have to ask what the other felt. So sex does not bond you. Sex is a thing that you share, like tennis. You both love tennis? Great. That doesn't make a marriage. So mutual pleasure does not bond it's only simultaneous it's not shared so the pleasure of sex and love are are valuable things but they get in the way of intimacy hmm. <clears throat> so what is intimacy intimacy means the intense pleasure of being with you. It's not a performance. It's not a thing. There's no asking afterwards, how was it? We were together. That's perfect. Otherwise, you turn it into a performance, and then there's anxiety, and you're not so good at it, and it was not so good, and you go to the supermarket, and the magazine says 14 secrets to better sex that you don't know. Oh, my, yeah, you go into crisis mode. <laughs> I'm not getting the best sex in the world. This is terrible. 
So you find out the 14 secrets. Now, next month, <laughs> the magazine said, 24 ways to improve your sex life. There's so 10 months. <laughs> I have to tell you a funny thing. I don't know if I mentioned it last time. Some guy is staring at me. And he comes over to me afterwards and he says, I I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. Do you sleep with your beard on top of the blanket or your beard under the blanket? <laughs> and for three weeks, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> You're trying to figure it out. <laughs> I'm sure, like, I put it under the blanket. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, I try it on top of the blanket. It's not any better. I, try, I couldn't sleep for three weeks. <laughs> you become self-conscious about something it interferes with your life. Mm. Intimacy is not a thing. It's us. It's us. We belong together. We are a we. So you ask your grandmother what happens in the bedroom. And your grandmother says, nothing. You say, come on, tell me. She says, nothing. <laughs> say, All right, you don't want to tell me? She did tell you. A bedroom is a no-thing zone. Intimacy means don't bring anything in between us. We are not both married to a third thing that brings us together. We're married to each other. I need you in my life. Having you in my life, that's it. That's, that's my goal. So you bring a television into the bedroom, not a good idea. You bring a computer into the bedroom. No. When you close the door of the bedroom, you are being intimate. Hmm. Because the bedroom creates that kind of vibration because it's a no thing zone. Like a sacred. So keep, yes. So <clears throat> if you want to change your intimate life, like with one single step, Try this. Never be intimate with the lights on. Only in the dark. In the dark. It's amazing what that's going to do. Because when it's dark, you can't see anything. You can't see anything. Now you can be intimate. As long as you see, you're going to see something. Things are not intimate. Things are pornographic. In fact, who introduced the idea of having the lights on? <clears throat> Remember the old television shows back in the 50s, early 60s? Never, never are couples intimate with the light on. You know when they turn off the lamp, they're going to be intimate. And that was normal. That was the normal, the standard. How did that change? Pornography. Because to take a video, you got to turn the lights on. It's terrible. It's amazing what this will do. Just turn off the lights. Stop thinking of things. Stop looking at things. Not even things about each other. Don't love everything about her. Love her. Yeah. Now, our, our, in the past... Marriages were much more solid. You know, we say in the good old days, people got married, it was forever, it was real. And the cynics say, oh, come on, they weren't happy in their marriages, they just couldn't get divorced. <laughs> right? Divorce wasn't an option for them, so they suffered. Yeah, that may be true. Look at the difference between them and us. We love everything about our spouse, just not our spouse. Mm. They had each other, and they hated everything about each other. <laughs> <laughs> so the pendulum is pretty much just swung all the way. The all way. the way, all the way. They wanted each other, and they had each other, and they were never going to give that up. But they hated what the other one did and the way they talked and the way they acted. And they, and they fought about it happily ever after. 
<laughs> I love it. I have a few, I have a few follow-up questions there. So um, the whole thing about intimacy, so as a coach, one of the things that I've seen in human beings, right? Like unless a human being is complete, we will always seek completion from the other. Like the other comes to fill up my void, quote unquote. And at least what I have found is that when that happens, in, like intimacy, true intimacy and connection cannot be there because it's, Oh, you're, you're either filling this void for me and I feel good. So for example, we can have sex. Like how many people, they won't have sex until, you know, all the boxes are checked. Well, he did this, he didn't do that, or she did this, or she didn't do that, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, okay, now we can, we can do this thing. So is there also this level of intimacy that we first get to create with ourselves so that we can create that in a, in a relationship? Intimacy with oneself? Yeah. The real you is what intimacy is about. If you can share yourself, that is an intimacy because you are intimate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you asked earlier about the rights to intimacy. A guy takes a, a girl out on a date and he expects to get physical. And the girl says, excuse me, I barely know you. <laughs> After the third date, okay, now there's something to consider. <laughs> yeah, it's a th three date what, right. What happened after three dates? What changed? Well, we got to know each other. No, you didn't. <laughs> One comedian says, all you know about the other guy is that he knows how to get to the, to the place for the date. Yep. He's got a sense of direction. That's, that's all you know. <laughs> so after 10 dates, does the man have a right to intimacy? 10 dates. How about six months? Now? Okay. How about if I put a ring on your finger? Now, all right, I'll marry you, okay? <laughs> you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> I'll, I'll marry you. Now, do I have rights? No. How about if we've been married for 10 years? Now, do I have any rights? The answer is no. As soon as you think you have rights, you're, you're abusive. That's rape. What, I mean, really, what is rape? Rape is the thought that I have a right mm. and you cannot say no to me because it's my right. You know, it's like a guy knocks on your door and says, where's my money? I said, excuse me, I have your money? He said, come on, it's in the Bible. When the poor man asks, you have to give, so give me my money. The guy says, excuse me. <laughs> the Bible tells me to give you my money. <laughs> not your money. You have, you have no rights to my money. I have a moral obligation to give you what you need. And if I don't, it's between me and God. Mm. You have no rights here. The same is true. If you're not going to be intimate with your spouse, it's grounds for divorce. Because it's one of your duties is to be intimate. But, but the responsibility is to God. You don't have any rights to my intimacy, ever. Here's, here's the real kicker, neither do I. Hmm. You can't own my intimacy and I don't have a right to give it away. Because if I can give it away, then it's not intimacy, it's just an it. So real intimacy, is not in my control, how can it be in my spouse's control? So that's what we mean by the sanctity of intimacy. There are certain things God never gave away, like life. You don't own your life. Hmm. You're not allowed to kill yourself. 
Suicide is punishable by death. <laughs> it's, it's murder. Yeah. You're not allowed to kill yourself. Your body, your body is not yours. You have to give it back in as good a shape as you as possible, you know, because God never really gave it away. It's not an object. And the same is true with intimacy. God never gave it away. It's too powerful. It's too dangerous. This is how you're going to create the next generation. God is not going to abandon that to us. Mm. So God says, no, 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 do it right. Because this is a, a rare gift. And to let you mess it up is like letting you mess up the world. Can't do that. Mm. So for the couples who are listening or, or any listeners right now, and they're starting to look at their relationship and go, okay, wow, there's definitely things that I can see that I'm missing or that intimacy is not present or that we've, you know, we have turned our relationship and the other person into a thing. I think they're probably at this point going like, okay, well, what, what do I do? How do I, and, and you know, I'm assuming the mind is going to go to how do I rekindle the love? How do we get the love back? How do we, you know, save this marriage? Like all of these things. Um, and, and, I, and I'd love for you to, to just take it in a whole different direction because it really isn't about that. Right. And, and don't go back to love. Exactly. That's how, you got, that's how you got into trouble in the first place. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Here's, here's a, what's more powerful than love? A word more powerful than love. Mine. Be mine. Much more powerful. To belong. See, we have a crisis. We're alone in the world. And, and that aloneness is a, is a, it's a medical crisis because it destroys our immune system and we become vulnerable to all sorts of illnesses when we feel that we're totally alone in the world. It's a horrible feeling and, and we're not meant to be that way. So not being alone, belonging, or the word home, what a powerful word. Yeah. So imagine this. There are those moments that everyone should have, moments, where what you're doing is so perfect that if nothing else ever happened, you would be completely content. You know, just stop time, freeze frame, but keep it this way forever. Like a mother looking at her baby when the baby's sleeping, of course. <laughs> Just perfect, right? Perfect. Can't be better. That's how home should feel. When you get married, you create a home. Imagine you come home. You are where you belong. You are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And you're with the person you're supposed to be with. There is nothing more powerful. One moment of it. Right now, there is no place else I would rather be. Right now, there is nothing else I would rather do. And right now, there's no one else I would rather be with. You have those three conditions coming together. You're in heaven. That is heaven. On earth, we can't figure out what we're doing here. You know, like the expression, what on earth am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> we don't know where we belong on earth, but when your soul comes back to heaven, which is exactly where it belongs, it feels like heaven because I'm home. Every home should feel that way. That is so much more powerful than love. And in fact, that's what you're going to love. Hmm. So instead of looking for love, which is a thing, instead of looking for sexual pleasure, which is a thing, go, go for, the, 
for the for the truth. Go for the whole package. Mm. I want a home where I know I belong. I'm I can shed all my anxieties, all my worries, all my I'm home. Mm. Relax. You came home, right? There's nothing greater or better than that. And at least in the bedroom. You know, maybe in the dining room, you feel a little stressed because you're not the best cook. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and did the rice come out? Did you yeah, wreck the rice? Exactly. <laughs> wreck the rice. <laughs> well, that's, that's anxiety producing. But in the bedroom, you got to know you are where you belong. And that feeling cannot, you can't fake it. I agree. You can't fake it. And here's where I think people fall into a lot of trouble is I, there is that moment in an early part of the relationship where everything lines up, like you said, and the person truly does feel like they're home. And then that feeling goes away. And they blame the other person, the relationship, the timing, the kids, the blah, 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 that the feeling is gone. The thing that they should be feeling all the time is gone. And then we go into this whole blame and judgment game that, that human minds tend to go into. Yeah. And it just starts spiraling because now instead of searching for home, People are searching for all the reasons they don't have the experience of home again. And then it's, it's him, it's her, it's, it's this, it's that. And they, they just stray so far off the path. And they know, they, they feel inside, like, I want to feel like that, like that moment. And they can't get it. So what about those? Because that, I, I feel like that's the problem with pretty much every relationship. If they came into it looking for love, then it's almost inevitable. Mm. The, love, the love will disappoint. Hmm. Love does not keep you together. Love keeps you apart. But even if they came into it with the right attitude, I want you in my life, things can get in the way. Yep. One of the things that gets in the way is the need to be right. So I sit with a couple, you know, doing marriage counseling and, you know, they massacre each other. Yeah. And then when they're finished, they say, so who's right? <laughs> say, See, Tell us, Rabbi, there, who's there's right? your problem right there. Wow. You want to be right or you want to be married. You can't have both. Yes. <laughs> when you're married, you're no longer right. You no longer need to be right. And it's so, it's so painful to, to watch this because in business, you never want to be right. You want to have a customer. So the customer is always right. What, what am I going to gain by being right? I'm going to lose a customer and I'll close the business down. So I don't want to be right. I want to be successful in the business. In marriage, why do you want to be right? You want to be right or do you want to have a home? You want to be right, go sign up for a logic course or something in, yeah. at the university. The other thing that gets in the way, loss of respect. It's a killer. Familiarity breeds contempt. Hmm. Too much familiarity and you hate each other. Yeah. And, and when you do, you are much nastier to your spouse than you would be with anybody else in your life because you're a decent guy. Yeah. But when it goes sour at home, when it goes sour in the bedroom, it's, it's dangerously nasty. So how do you avoid, if familiarity breeds contempt, then, then marriage has no chance. Hmm. I mean, how, how familiar do you get? Yeah. Years of living together, right? See, that's why another brilliant idea, separate beds. Separate beds. 
Don't ever get into bed with your spouse and say, I just want to sleep. Well, thank you very much. I love you too. You're right there next to each other and all you want to do is sleep. That familiarity is so deadening. So I was thinking about the old television shows in I Love Lucy, turn off the lamp, they're being intimate. But then I realized, wait a minute, they were also in separate beds. Television was not allowed to show a single bed. Yeah. Uh, you know. And then I realized that's such a brilliant idea because if you're going to be intimate, show a little initiative. <laughs> 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 this is serious, you know, get up at least, you know. <laughs> show a little, in, it's not like, eh, we're here already anyway, so. No, it's terrible. Mm. So these are the two things. There are others, of course. But the main killers is the loss of respect, the loss of dignity. You can't be intimate with someone you, you, you look down upon because it's going to become abusive. Yeah. Uh, and also the desire to be right. Yeah, so true. It puts up such a barrier. But I'm right. Yeah, so. Yeah. So I'm not budging. I will do nothing until you admit that I was right. Yeah. What is that? What it, is that? My, my first, first mentor said he had this great, great saying where he said, you can either be right or you can be in love. You can either be right or you can be rich. You can either be right or you could be happy. You can't ever be both. And uh, it's so true. I mean, to the human mind, being wrong has the same equivalent of death. It's like, if I'm wrong, it's, I basically die. And so we fight for our position, like our life depends on it, where maybe in other settings, it's still not effective, but in other settings, it's, you know, bearable, but in, in a relationship, in an intimate relationship, um, it really, it's a killer. And the thing that you're saying about respect, you know, what's the funniest is that the things that when someone first meets and they tell their friend like, oh my God, she does this thing and I love that. And those are the things that we end up hating about them <laughs> afterwards. Ah, oh, it's amazing. Um, here's, here's an interesting. Yeah, please. To pick a silly example. Yeah. I say to you, two and two is four. You say, no, it's five. I said, nope, it's four. We fight it out. And it turns out that I was right. I was right. I made two and two four. <laughs> what do you mean I was right? Mm. What I said was right. Mm. It's true that two and two is four. That doesn't make me right. Mm. It wasn't my opinion. I didn't invent this thought. So when you're arguing about a truth, it's a good argument. I mean, you got to know what's right. You got to know what's what. But why does it always have to become so personal? It's like, if two and two is not four, I'm insulted. <laughs> yeah. Don't take it personally. Yeah. And if two and two is four, I'm a genius. No, you're yeah. not. Two and two is four. Somebody happened to tell you that, so you know it. But it's not your opinion. Don't make it so personal. Why is everything about me? That me monster has got to go. Yeah. There's something, you know, even deeper than that. You know, that example is, is easy to see. Most of the stuff that people argue about, right? It's just an opinion that's formed by news they read or a thing they heard or something they read in a book or et cetera. And we still fight for it like it's, we have to prove this specific point. And what I always go back to is, you know, what you believe today about certain things in your life. If I took you back 10 years ago, you had a different set of beliefs at that moment that you also thought were the absolute truth. Like you would argue with yourself and yet we fight for in the moment, like this is it. I have to, you have to believe what I believe. And Look, I'm very competitive growing up. And as I did more and more personal development and, and spiritual work on myself, I realized like I'm having an experience. You're having an experience. Your experience is 
100% valid. It is your experience. Who am I to say that my experience is more valid than your experience in that moment? And when I finally like let that soak in, what is the point of arguing? You get to have yours. I get to have mine. Great. And it's like in a very, very short period of time, the amount of arguing and bickering and having to prove yourself and be right about stuff, those conversations don't even show up in my life anymore. Where before is, you know, people would argue around you, but you're the energy of, I want to argue around stuff. Now it's gone and it's just different. A guy called me from Israel. He says, my 12 year old daughter got it into her head that God is angry at her and mm. she's miserable mm. and they've taken her to to uh therapists and to no, nothing works nothing works she's miserable and then he does this this thing that i hate he puts her on the phone mm. he says here talk to her Aye. right so i said to her god is angry at you she says yeah i said i'm so jealous she says, what? I said, you're 12 years old and you can get God angry? Hmm. When did you become so important? It's like, it's like you discovered kryptonite. <laughs> <laughs> you can get God angry? Her problem was over. Wow. I can imagine she's now telling her friends, God is angry at me. You're nothing. <laughs> <laughs> You want me to show you how to get God angry at you? <laughs> but she's writing a book right now about this, Rabbi. <laughs> but the thing is, everybody was telling her, no, no, God is not angry at you. You're so cute. You know, <laughs> What are you arguing with her? Mm. She is experiencing something. Yes. Which might even be true. What are you arguing? Stop mm. arguing about everything. Go with and, and you'll get to a truth, no, no, not, not to a, a make-believe solution. You'll, you'll get to some. If God is angry at us, is that not the biggest compliment in the world? Hmm. I mean, are we really significant enough even to hate us? So true. It's a compliment. Yeah. You know, God should remain angry at us forever. That would um, be what one other thing that that arose in the book and i've um i've had a, a few different things about this uh and i've read in a few different places different versions of this so i'm just curious you spoke about uh in the book how god chooses when the baby is conceived the, the soul basically chooses the body um chooses the parents um you know certain things and you spoke about before about how the energy of the creation of that baby is so, so important. Um, and I just have to tell you a funny little story. This is probably too much information for you or my listeners, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, so when we were uh, in the process of conceiving our, our first my wife, it, it took us a while. It just, you know, it didn't just happen. It took us a while. And I would just so intentionally, you know, every time uh, we would have sex, I would so intentionally like see the energy coming down and through and creating this beautiful being and all this stuff. And the day that my son was conceived was my wife's 30th birthday party. And I'm sitting at my computer trying to create a playlist. And I found out that four years of music that I had, uh, I, I do DJing for fun, four years of my music had just gone. Like the, the hard drive just wiped it out. And I'm sitting there in the kitchen, irate, like so upset that this thing was taken from me. I know now looking back, it's insane, but at this moment, this is how I'm feeling. And my wife yells downstairs, she's like, you know, she's doing the test strips and all this stuff. She goes, Baby, I'm ovulating. We need to do it now. And I'm like, I have no interest in doing this right now. Like, I'm in the worst possible state. She goes, don't worry about it. Just come upstairs and you could just lie there. And literally, this is the moment 
that our son gets conceived. Now, granted, he's like a beautiful, amazing human being. I just found it to be hilarious that all these other times I was so intentional, putting so much energy and focus and thought into this. And the time that it happened was this like, I'm so angry at the world. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because my question is this, like as a soul, at least from, from what I believe and, and sense to be true, I don't know this to be true, just my, my from, from what I've gathered internally is, you know, we choose very specific life experiences in certain timelines with certain people to have certain experiences life, this lifetime so that we can grow and develop into something. So when a soul is choosing that, whether it's an illness or a deformity or to uh, be born into a family that's filled with anger or anything like that, is that on purpose in a sense? Like, are, are we choosing that? Is God choosing that? You know, what, what's, how, how do you see this whole thing happening? Souls don't choose. Souls don't choose. <clears throat> no, in fact, souls never want to be born. Hmm. No soul wants to leave heaven to come down to this messed world. No. The soul does not want to be born. It accepts its mission humbly, like, you know, being sent off to war, but mm. it doesn't want. So when your child in a bad mood says, I didn't ask to be born, mm. he's right. He's so right. Neither did you. So don't argue. You're right. Nobody asks to be born. And why don't we ask to be born? Because we don't need to be born. We are born into a mission. We are sent. We do not choose. And that's why it makes sense to serve God. Because you don't really want to be here. This is not your agenda. This is not your plan. So if you have nothing else to do, you have a minute for God? <laughs> God does have a plan, and he did create you for a reason. So as long as you're not employed, can you do something for him? Hmm. Or can you do something for each other? And it's really, really helpful. There are people today who are worth $100 billion. Yeah. It's mind-boggling. Can anybody who is worth a hundred billion dollars really think that all that money was meant for him? No way. If he lived a thousand years, he couldn't spend it. So it can't possibly be meant for him. And that's why they all feel like they want to give away most of what they have because it, it doesn't fit. You know, they, got, they don't have pockets that big. <laughs> so they have to give it away, not because they're generous, but because it just doesn't belong to them. Mm. Now we can understand, if you happen to have information, you really believe it was meant for you to keep? Come on. You have love. You have compassion. You have talent. It's all meant for you. It doesn't make sense. Mm. And, and the billionaires really give us a clear and picture of this that, that help us. So all this pop psychology, you have to love yourself first. You were given love to use in your mission, not to keep it under your mattress, mm. like a guy keeping his money under his mattress. It's crazy. What are you doing with it? Oh, I'm keeping it. I want to have money. You don't have money. You don't have life. You live it, which means you give it, you share it, you look around and see what you can do for others because you didn't even ask to be born. Mm. <laughs> so having an egotistical, selfish lifestyle makes no sense. It's like the guy with a hundred billion dollars and he keeps it under his mattress. Yeah. King size mattress. <laughs> Very king. And, and it's not comfortable to sleep on. <laughs> so, 
What are you gaining by this? So the me monster has become so laughable. You now we used to think being humble is a pious, religious, philosophical, spiritual. Being selfless is almost impossible. How can you? No, the me monster doesn't make sense anymore. We know too much. The world is too open yeah. to be so parochial and to be so tiny in our thinking which is what enables us to be intimate. To be intimate like two drops of water side by side, what keeps them separate? Hmm. Why aren't they flowing? Water is supposed to flow. Why aren't they flowing into each other? Because there's a surface tension. Hmm. What will it take to make them flow into each other? Almost nothing. Now breathe on it. Just break that little bit of tension. They will become one. So that little bit of tension that says, I'm right, that says, I got to get, I have to have, get rid of that because it's not true. You don't have to have, you don't have to get, you didn't even ask to be born. So make yourself useful. <laughs> <laughs> make yourself useful. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Brilliant. Rabbi, so much fun just, just being in your presence. And I, I really uh, encourage everyone to go out and grab the book. Uh, do you want to tell them where they can grab it? Thejoyofintimacy.org or itsgoodtoknow.org. Itsgoodtoknow.org. Beautiful. Um, anything else that you want to share with the audience before, uh, before we wrap this up? If you try this, um, no lights, maybe even a separate bed, that's, that's a big investment. Yeah. But no lights doesn't cost you anything. You'll be amazed. Because after enjoying sex, you feel a little diminished. It takes something out of you. You lose a little respect for yourself and a little respect for the person you're with. Intimacy is the opposite. When you really dissolve into each other, break that surface tension, and take pleasure just in being together, you come away feeling not diminished. You feel more innocent than before. Because hmm. that part of us that can get rid of all things, including the me monster, that is our innocent self. Mm. After being intimate, you are more innocent than before. So marriage is not a downward spiral. On the contrary, every day, every time you've been intimate, you, you've grown, you've merged, you've, you've, blended with each other more and more until you become truly one, inseparable, which means I don't know. I don't know who I am if you're not there. Because hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm a we. I'm, there's no surface tension. There's nothing keeping me separate from you. That's what takes away the feeling of being alone forever. And even when you're on opposite sides of the, of the ocean, you may miss each other. And that's a blessing because you have someone to miss. Yep. So we should all have wonderful marriages, wonderful homes. You come home and all the burdens of the world slip away. You are where you belong doing what you should be doing with the person you belong with. There's nothing better. That's heaven. We should Honor. all go. We should all go to heaven. <laughs> we should all go to heaven. Yeah. I, uh, I couldn't agree more. It, it's, uh, you know, what, what resonated with me the most today is that home. And it, it's interesting because it's a sensation that has led me time and time again. Um, not just in my relationship, 
just in life, you know, I, I actually, that sensation in my heart when I'm even talking about a, a potential business partnership or doing something or not doing something, I seek inside from that intuitive guidance system, that feeling and that feeling that I have is home. It's that vibration that just says, this is so right and I don't need this or anybody else to explain what it is to me. It is truly just a guidance system. And uh, funny enough, uh, the, the song that our mine and my wife's song was, uh, was all about that. It was all about home. So it was just really interesting to, to feel that. See, this, um, is what a, this is what a synagogue should feel like. Hmm. You walk into a synagogue and you're Jewish, you're home. Yeah. You're home. You'll never have to apologize for yeah. being in a synagogue. You'll never feel guilty for being in a synagogue. And that's why it's so bad when synagogues make you feel guilty. Yeah. Or any religion, not just, yeah. I mean, churches and I'm sure mosques is just, it's, it's become prevalent. You know, it's, uh, yeah. let me shame you and guilt you into uh, being here, which is the worst possible energy that any human being can ever experience. And it's the wrong venue. Yeah. This is where I'm supposed to be safe. This is where I'm supposed to feel at home. Mm. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy travel schedule i know you're you're constantly moving about it was this is, uh this is not taking out time from my life this is my life i i that's exactly how i feel i you know i get off of these um interviews not all of them um but when it when it's this kind of conversation like this and i actually pause for a moment and um there's a certain vibration in the body, right? Like that feeling of home that we're talking about. And I, uh, I ask God, just, I request that this is how I get to feel all the time. And what I find is that instead of focusing on what to get and what to have and business, you know, money in the bank and this and that, the more I focus on being in that vibration of home and feeling that, and requesting that that be my experience in life, the gifts that are bestowed, the people that, you know, like how you showed up and how this all came to be. And to me, it's just all confirmation that this, like this is the frequency that I choose to live in. Uh, this is the frequency that I choose to have with my kids. Again, now this is not all the time. I'm still human, right? We spoke about feelings and the ebbs and flows of stuff. Uh, and yet this is, these are the times that, yeah, it really, it really feels good to be alive when it's like this. So people should order this book you see behind me. That's right. It really can make a difference. Yes, it can. If you, if you don't need it, you probably know someone who does. Yeah. So here's, here's the final line. <laughs> friends don't let friends get married without this book. <laughs> <laughs> it's too dangerous. <laughs> Friends don't let friends have love and sex. <laughs> frivolously. Yeah, frivolously. Rabbi, such a pleasure spending time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much. I wish you well in everything. And, and truly, thank you for the work that you're doing. And uh, especially in relationships, I think uh, it makes a m massive difference in the world when people live from this place. Let's make it a good world. That's it. That's Let's our responsibility. It. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.